This video is continuing right where the previous video left off. All the code that I'm going to show you in this video will work in Octave, but first you have to download the symbolic package and you have to run PKG load symbolic. The first thing that we're going to do is very useful. We're going to be able to solve symbolic equations and solve symbolic expressions. And I'll tell you what that means in a second. So here I've got a symbolic variable X and I've got an expression X minus three. So right down here, where I call the solve function on E1, my symbolic expression, what MATLAB does is it sets the expression equal to zero and then solves for the variable. Normally it wouldn't make any sense to say, how do you solve an expression? But that's what's happening. The expression is being set equal to zero and then solved. And here you see another expression, x squared minus nine. And so when I solve E2, it gets set equal to zero and solved for x and I get both solutions because three squared is nine, but negative three squared is also nine. Now what happens when there's multiple variables? Well, solve just defaults to solving for x. So here our solution has y in it and that's just fine. Now, if instead you wanna solve for y, it's quite easy. So in the solve function, in its parentheses, we say, what are we operating on? This expression E1 and then comma, what are we solving for? And we can put in the y and here we get two solutions because the y is squared in the expression. This next example is not only more complicated because there's more variables involved, but it is actually a symbolic equation. So P equals these other values on the right-hand side of the equation. And when I solve for that, it will still solve for a particular variable. And I simply put in the variable that contains, in this case, the symbolic equation, comma, the variable that I wanna solve for. So in this case, I'll solve for T. So the equal sign here represents mathematical equals. And this is quite a bit hard to solve for T, or at the very least, you need to remember your logarithm rules, but MATLAB is able to solve it for us. In this comment down below on line 221, I write out as best I can the algebra showing how you would solve this by hand. This is my starting equation right here. The very first thing I'm gonna do is divide both sides by P0. And then on the next line, I'm gonna take the natural log of both sides. So E raised to the power, the inverse of that is to take the natural log. So natural log of E raised to a power, that just cancels out. And I sort of unlock that inner portion, that R times T that was stuck up in the parentheses. And from there, it's super easy. I just divide both sides by R. And then uh, I can reverse both sides of the equation. I can put the T on the left side uh, just because it's more convenient to write it that way. Now that's mathematically what I'm doing, right? In programming, when we use a single equal sign, it's a very different thing. Continuing on down, we'll see that we can use this solve function to solve systems of equations. Now, uh, a few videos back in the matrix algebra session, I showed that you could solve systems of equations using matrix algebra. And that's fine and that's great. In fact, in most scenarios, it's gonna be faster than this here, but the solve function has one big advantage. And that is that it can solve nonlinear systems of equations. So if instead of x, y, and z, and however many other variables to the first power, we had, for example, an x squared or a square root of z or whatever. And as long as there is a solution to that system of equations, the solve function can find it. All right, and then I just ran it and got my solutions. I did display the solution out twice. Also, this is the exact same example that I used in the matrix algebra section. So you can go back to that video and compare and see that those numbers are the same. I do need to set up my three equations First, I declare symbolic variables, x, y, and z, and then I put into three different variables, which I uninventively named one, two, and three, the three equations in my system. And then I just pass all three into my solve function. And just for kicks, let's change this to an x squared and see if this system still has a solution. Oh, it does. Okay, so, you know, there's no guarantee that me just playing around gives it a solution, but it does. So here, now I'm solving a different system and it turns out it has you know, more solutions here, but I'm solving a different system that could not be solved using the matrix algebra methods shown in a different video. But that was just a little experiment. Let me scroll on down here because I need to talk about this result variable that I'm getting back from the solve function. It's not just like a vector of results, right? It's not just a vector of three numbers. This result variable is storing its information in what's called a struct. Now, if you've ever programmed in C, 
Yes, this is exactly what is meant by a struct uh, in MATLAB is the same as in the C programming language. But for those of you who are not familiar with that, you should just think of it as a variable containing other variables. It's a bag of variables. And this particular result variable contains three fields, which is a technical term for these variables contained within it. And those fields are named X, Y, and Z, and they have associated values negative two, five, and negative six. Now the format of these variables is actually symbolic. It may look like a number, but notice how the indentation on the one solution of negative two, five and negative six is different from the other set of negative two, five and negative six. That indentation is different because some of them are symbolics, so that's the default result type. And after I use this double function right here to convert to the numeric type known as double, then they become a numeric type. And double, by the way, is the default numeric type that we've been dealing with throughout this entire course. When I use the double function, nothing is being multiplied by two. What's happening is the information in the parentheses of the double function is being converted to the type named double. The name double comes from the fact that the variable is twice as large in memory as a single or floating point type variable, which is simply an older type of memory when memory was more expensive. So 32-bit floats, 64-bit doubles. Double is just a name for a twice as large in memory type of numeric value. Also, I should mention that I'm accessing these fields, these variables within the variable named result, just by saying result dot and then the other variable name, so result dot x. So whatever your struct variable is, you just use its name and then dot, and then you use the name of the field or the variable within it. Next, we're gonna talk about substitution. This is very much the substitution that you've heard of in algebra class, where you've got some variable and you wanna substitute in a value for it, or maybe you have an expression that you need to substitute in for a particular variable because that variable is equal to the expression. So I just went ahead and ran it here. So I declare a whole bunch of symbolic variables right here, and then I've got a quadratic, just your typical quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c. I'm representing the coefficients using symbolic variables. And suppose that I don't want to use x. I actually needed to use t. So all I'm doing here is substituting t in for x, and that's this line right here. So subs is the built-in MATLAB function. Quadratic is what I'm substituting into. x is what I'm removing, and I'm replacing it with t. And so your inputs just go in in that order. First, what are you operating on? Second, what are you replacing? And third, the thing that you are replacing it with. And in this section, I'm just gonna do a bunch more substitutions. So I'm gonna set my variable function of time equal to subs function of time t 1.5. So I'm plugging in 1.5 for t. So in the output in the command window, there's the quadratic with t's instead of the x's and then below it. So now instead of t, we've got the result when 1.5 is substituted in. Don't be surprised if you see like 9 over 4 times a. I'm actually not quite sure why I'm getting the 2.2500 here. Usually when I'm dealing with the symbolics, it keeps all the numbers in a rational format. And I don't know if they changed that and I changed versions or if I changed a setting somewhere, but for whatever reason, it's displaying it out. I mean, kind of as you maybe expect it here as the decimal values but in many situations it uses uh, rational numbers. So just don't be surprised if you see those. The 9 fourth would appear because 1.5 squared or 3 halves squared is 9 fourths. And so further substitutions, I substitute in 4 for b and then I substitute in 10 for c and they get my final result down below. And here is the code that does those substitutions. I do a series of sequential substitutions here, and each time I set function of time equal to the result of substituting, operating on function of time, removing whatever it is, whether it's T, A, B, or C, and replacing it with the corresponding value. If I don't set something equal, if I just do subs function of time right here all by itself, that does nothing. Sometimes people get confused and they think, oh, I ran subs, so it performed the substitution. No, it didn't alter anything. Sure, it did perform a substitution, but then it just gives you the result. And if you don't put that result into a variable, often the original variable that you're also operating on, nothing will be affected. So we have to put into function of time the result of the substitution. 
And finally, at the end, I use the double function on my variable named function of time to convert from the symbolic result to a numeric double result. And we can see that down in the command window over here. And so you'll see that the solution variable is 13.75, whereas all the other variables are one by one symbolics. And if I scroll to the right a little bit, you'll see under the class column that it is a double. And that is our default type. And by the way, if you're not seeing any of these uh, other columns that I have, you just click on the circle with the down triangle in it, and then go to choose columns, and you can select or unselect from the menu there. A very reasonable question that you might be asking yourself at this point is, well, isn't this just a lot harder than just using numeric variables? Yes, it is. But I'm trying to show you relatively simple examples so that when you come across something where you do need to perform more complex algebraic manipulations, you'd like to use the solve function or the substitution function, or you'd like to use some of the functions from the previous video. You can understand how to do so because you've seen examples that are simpler. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you is going to be basic on purpose as a learning example. Here's another substitution example that's pretty much exactly the same as the previous, but with less printing, so you can focus on the substitution aspects. And also I wanna compare this right here to what's down beneath it, because you can do multiple substitutions all on one line, and that's what I do right here. So I've got on line 314, one single substitution. So subs on the quadratic expression right up there, curly brackets, a, B, C, and X. All of these things are being substituted out and they are being replaced with, comma, another set of curly brackets, negative 1, 4, 10, and 1.5. And the order does matter. A is being replaced with negative 1, B is being replaced with 4, C is replaced with 10, X is replaced with 1.5. The reason that I like to start with this long way here is because in some ways I think it's more readable. This shorter way right here, well, people forget the curly brackets. Sometimes people put the inputs in in the wrong order, so they end up replacing one variable with the value of a different variable. I think this way is quite possibly easier to read. Continuing on down here, we're going to look at sim fun. Uh, this is a lot less fun than it sounds. Um, this is a built-in MATLAB function that is going to convert a symbolic expression into basically an anonymous function. So if you ever want to do a whole bunch of calculations, but you don't want to run subs over and over and over again, this can be quite a bit more convenient. So I'll go ahead and run this section right here, and then I'll explain the code. I've got an arbitrary quadratic right here, and then I use simfun to put into a variable named q the quadratic expression using x as an input variable. So basically, whenever in the future I use q as if it's a function and I give it a single input, that input will be substituted where wherever x appears in the original symbolic expression. Now on this line 329, I also use the double function then to convert from the symbolic result to a numeric double type result. This is the same as, what I've done on line 329 is the same as what I've got on line 331, where I use subs, and I substitute out x and I replace it with zero, and then I also convert it to double. So by running simfun just once up here, I can put into q this anonymous function, and then I can just say q parentheses zero, q parentheses one. I can keep doing substitutions without having to write out this more complex sub functions here and here. And then a couple examples uh, follow here. Also, it works perfectly on vectors, even if you're not using the element-wise operators, even if you're not using like dot star, you're just using regular star, it still works on vectors. And so here I run it on a vector with 0, 1, and 6, and I get the same three results that I got separately in the previous section. And if you don't like simfun, these anonymous functions can be created from symbolic functions just like this. So you just declare your variable, in this case I used h, and then parentheses whatever the inputs are, and also, I'm also demonstrating there can be more than one input, and you just set it equal to your symbolic expression. So the code that I'm showing on line 355 here is identical to what I've got commented out right here. And you can see I pass in one and pi, and I get the result of five. And you can check that for yourself that that is correct. If you do choose to use simfun and there's more than one input, you actually use square brackets uh, with those different inputs inside of it. I know it can be very confusing which sort of brackets do I use. 
um, I recommend looking it up, right? I recommend always referring back to an example. It's what I do, because it is hard to remember. And this section right here is also equivalent to the previous section. I'm just showing it with two substitutions, right? I'm doing my usual thing of showing multiple ways of doing something, not because you need to know all of them, but because if you understand one of them, it can help you understand the other mechanisms of doing this. So here I do two substitutions, replace x with one, replace y with pi, and then convert my result to a double. Next up, I'm gonna show a ballistics example. Here is our little ballistics problem. We want to know how far a projectile has traveled horizontally given some information about its initial velocity and gravity and things like that. So it's a basic parabolic motion problem here. We're going to use 100 meters per second for the initial velocity and 9.8 meters per second squared for gravity. Here are our two equations that we're going to use. The horizontal distance, dist underscore x, is going to be initial velocity times time times the cosine of the angle at which the projectile was launched. And our vertical distance is going to be initial velocity times time times the sine of the launch angle minus one half times gravity times time squared. Our strategy, or how we're going to do this, is we're going to figure out when the projectile hits the ground, because that's going to be at a vertical distance or a height of zero, and then we'll solve for time, and we'll plug that time value into the horizontal distance equation. Back in MATLAB, we're all set up right here. I'm going to start off by declaring my symbolic variables, v naught, t, theta, and g. Theta I'm using as the angle of launch. Here I've got y equal to my vertical distance calculation my x equal to my horizontal distance calculation. And then on line 387 here, uh, I have a new variable named impact time. And I'm gonna set it equal to solving y for time. Remember that if you're solving a symbolic expression as opposed to an equation, what the solve function is gonna do is automatically set that expression equal to zero. But that's exactly what we want here. Now we get two results one result of zero and one result of this thing right here two times v naught, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to ignore the zero because that's basically the time at which the object was launched. It lands at two times v naught sine theta divided by g. And we can then fill in those values for a particular situation to figure out exactly when it lands. Down below in the comment here, I've got the algebra that the solve function worked through for us. So we don't really need this, but I included it uh, for teaching purposes. I set the equation equal to zero. Factor out a t. All right, so that's my first solution where t equals zero. So I basically divide both sides by t. I don't need that anymore. Then this is what I've got left over. I'm going to add one half g times t to both sides. So there it is on the left. And then I just divide both sides by one half g. And I put my t on the left side, so it's t equals. And then since I don't want a one half in the denominator, dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by two. So I just put the two up in the numerator. And what I'm left with is an equation for the time at which the vertical distance is zero, time at which it landed on the ground. We only want the second solution. Impact time is a vector. So when I do my substitution down here, I'm gonna substitute into x, the horizontal distance, replacing t with what t equals. Impact time parentheses two, the second impact time, not the first one. And impact time is a vector of symbolic expressions, which is a little bit different from vectors we've seen in the past that were mostly numeric. This vector contains a symbolic zero and then a symbolic to v naught sine theta over g. The result after the substitution is something that looks fairly complicated because we've replaced the t's with this more complex multivariable expression. So I show the algebra right down here beneath the substitution. So this one I'm highlighting right here used to be just t, but now it's this 2 v naught sine theta over g. And so then we're going to simplify this a little bit. There's a trig identity that's involved, and then this is my result. So this is what x equals. This is the horizontal distance traveled when an object lands on the ground. So then I apply simplify on impact distance. That's where the trig identity was applied right there. And then I chose to use simfun to substitute in the particular values for theta, v naught, and g to solve this particular instance of the problem. I could have used substitutions, but I'm using simfun right here just as another demonstration of it. I declare in square brackets that the three input variables will be theta, v naught, and g. And then down below, I actually create new variables for it, angle equals pi over four. That wasn't declared in the PowerPoint, but that's we're deciding that the angle was pi over four, same as 45 degrees. 
V is 100, G is 9.8, and then further down below, I say Hora's distance, that's just my new variable, equals F of theta parentheses angle comma V comma G. I'm plugging those values into the function to get my result, but it is still a symbolic and I need to use the double function to convert it to a numeric type. And then I finally display it out. Our cannonball or whatever projectile we're using traveled 1020.4 meters. That's gonna wrap it up for this video. The next video is gonna pick up right where this one left off, and we're going to see how to do the derivative in MATLAB. So MATLAB is gonna do our calculus homework.